Hello and welcome to Roguelike Radio, the procedurally generated podcast where all of the participants eventually die. In this episode we are talking about gameplay oriented procedural generation. Talking in this episode we have... Jim Shepard, the developer behind Dungeon Mounts. Happy to be here, chat about uh, procedural this and that and all sorts of gameplay stuff. Thanks. Mark Johnson, I make Ultra Martyr Vegan. Brett Gildersleeve, I'm the creator of Rogue Space Marine. And I'm Dan Gray, I've made lots of little roguelikes. So, we're talking about gameplay oriented procedural generation. We've we've talked very generally about procedural generated generation on the show before, but I particularly want to talk about what I would call designed procedural generation. Uh, coming down specifically to things like level design and how that fits around the actual mechanics of the game and how you expect or want the player to be behaving. And I'm particularly thinking uh, both Jim and Brett gave talks at IRDC in America, the inferior one, uh, about the about their procedural design systems uh, in their games, in Rogue Space Marines and in Dungeon Mans. Uh, Brett, you gave uh, a very nice detailed talk about how you were inspired by Spelunky's mechanics and about some of the kind of the initial designs you had and how you changed those to better fit the gameplay. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, about how you approach your procedural generation in Rogue Space Marine? Sure. Thanks, Darren. Uh, so this year I entered the seven day roguelike challenge for the first time and. It was my first attempt at actually creating a game, so there were a lot of things that I had to learn from scratch. And when I set out on this challenge, I I wanted, of course, to make a a roguelike that would be uh, maybe accepted by the community and something that people would like to play. But you know, it actually turns out that there are some certain things that I I didn't like about the typical roguelike formula. I know that's blasphemy to say on roguelike radio but uh you know there were some things that i wanted to change and um the gameplay elements that i decided to kind of get rid of were things like hit points which are uh something that is very standard and it's it's something that we inherited from older games like dungeons and dragons and just sort of never went away but i i kind of found them as sort of arbitrary and i i decided well, maybe I can I can try to do something interesting where, you know, hit points are not an issue. Um, it's based on abilities. It's a fast combat oriented. Uh, really feels more like an action game that has been sort of turned into a turn based game. And so the games that really inspired me when I was creating this game were uh, Spelunky, in taking elements of its its level design. And the gameplay actually took a lot from this game, which is in development right now, from uh, Vlambeer, and the name of the game is Nuclear Throne. It feels a lot like Binding of Isaac. It's kind of a twin-stick, bullet-dodging, combat mayhem game, but it's it's real-time. So I, I kind of wanted to make a uh, a turn-based version of that. Now, the problem here is that this this really doesn't fit the the traditional roguelike uh, archetype. And when I started trying to make a level generation system, I, I used Rogue, really, as a starting point. And I very quickly discovered that it just it simply didn't work. And, and the reason behind that, I, I kind of quickly learned, is that the architecture of the levels, the, the sort of space in which the player is experiencing this game, really largely needs to be designed around the gameplay itself. And I was taking architecture that was pretty much created for this uh, turn-based, moving around, bumping to attack kind of gameplay style, and I was trying to force upon it this almost uh, feeling real-time, um, bullet-dodging sort of combat mayhem game style, and it, it just simply didn't work. Um, and so that was actually really great because it forced me to um, experiment and try to come up with a new style of level generation that I, I probably wouldn't have come across otherwise. So rooms and corridors are the kind of the traditional thing going back to the original Rogue. I don't know if they're 
they're specifically influenced by Dungeons and Dragons or if they were specifically based on the gameplay for Rogue, but you your game had a lot of kind of archery stuff in it. I say archery, range combat stuff in it. Which which doesn't suit corridors at all. Range combat is very boring in corridor, corridors, obviously. So what what did you then go on to to experiment with to get the the level design the, the right architecture for your game? Yes, absolutely. When you have a game that is largely reliant on ranged combat, and and Rogue Space Marine certainly is. I think in the twenty five to thirty enemy varieties that I created, nearly all of them are are ranged attackers. And so yes, the the first attempts that I made. Uh, featuring large open rooms and long, narrow hall- hallways and corridors. Uh, it just really didn't work um, because the main problem was there was there was no cover for the player to get behind. And the mechanics of the game are really that uh, enemies are always trying to get a line of sight to the player. When they achieve a line of sight, they will attempt to uh, fire, but there's there's always a little bit of a delay. So there's a delay when they're aiming... There's uh, a delay after they shoot, kind of a recoil effect, and they have this little thought bubble above their head, which um, I kind of got that idea from Metal Gear Solid. It gives you a little bit of insight into the AI. What is the AI doing? Is the AI hunting me? Does it even see me? Is it, uh, is it about to attack me? So basically, the gameplay became this uh, sort of cat and mouse. You would want to be waiting behind cover until the moment was right, until you had an opportunity uh, when an enemy was reloading or something like that, and you had a moment to kind of get a jump on them. And so what I discovered was it was really interesting to have these sort of semi-open rooms with a little bit of scattered cover in them, some movement obstacles, um, and nothing that's too big and open, because if you create a very large open space, the player isn't able to cross that uh, without being fired upon. So it was it was really a matter of just experimenting at the beginning with hand making rooms and trying them all out trying to find the perfect size trying to find you know how much cover was appropriate and fun and you know for example at some certain point if you add too much cover then it it becomes not fun anymore because the challenge goes away so it it was really a question at the beginning of making everything by hand and sort of getting a sense for the space, the gameplay space uh, that made for the most fun experience. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting challenge. So did you uh, add extra terrain types that would provide cover? Yes, so basically there are, there are kind of two sorts of obstacles. You know, one of them is just a wall, so nothing can move through a wall, nothing can pass through a wall, so it provides cover both to the enemies and to the player. Uh, there is also something that I just dubbed an obstacle or a decoration. And uh, decorations are interesting because neither the player nor the enemy can pass through them, um, but both can fire over them. So it's, uh, it's an impediment to movement, but it does not provide protection against attacks. So basically taking those two elements and coming up with an interesting uh, mix of the two really creates an interesting space to play in. And then, of course, because I, I grew up on Doom, and Doom uh, really influenced me in a lot of ways, and one of the best parts of Doom, if you ask me, is the exploding barrels, because you can take a situation that maybe otherwise would have been uh, kind of boring from a gameplay perspective, and then you can stick an exploding barrel into the middle of the room, and then suddenly everything turns on its head, because, you know, that's... That's a, it's a powder keg ready to go off. If, uh, if the player hits it, they might be able to take advantage of that fact, but, but then again, you know, an enemy might hit it and damage the player. So it's, it's really kind of a wild card. So basically this combination of, of walls, uh, these decorations or obstacles, and these exploding barrels, those are really the only three things in the game uh, of any importance besides the player and the enemies. Mm-hmm. So it's very simple. Simple is good. Simple can be effective, and especially in procedural generation. Yeah, I find it really interesting thinking about these kind of these obstacles that you have in in level design. And a a normal level designer, like a traditional level designer, would normally balk at the idea of this sort of thing being procedurally generated because things like Mario are very carefully handcrafted. 
to consider kind of the player experience through these different obstacles and and how the player would approach this but in procedural generation of course you don't have a lot of control over that you need to make sure that the player can get around the obstacles you need to make sure that there's a kind of a, a like a minimum challenge level and a maximum challenge level but guaranteeing it being interesting is is a little bit of kind of hope and luck but yeah it worked out very well in rogue space marine which i think comes down to this kind of this thought of what will make the levels interesting beyond simply the, the normal terrain of floor tiles and wall tiles and the normal structure of rooms and corridors. Uh, Jim, you gave a talk as well at IRDC on on your procedural generation in Dungeon Mans, and you've got the trickier task of having to support multiple gameplay types, not just ranged combat. Um, but you had a, a really wonderful example, I thought, of uh, how to teach people how to move diagonally, uh, in particular in the early levels. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I do, actually. The uh, trickier task, like you mentioned, is uh, just like at IRDC, I had the same talk to give as Brett, and he got to go first. So, uh, <laughs> again, Sorry, I'll be Jim. rehashing information nobody wants to hear in a more boring fashion. That's, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I did try to do things early on that uh, taught players how to how to move and play without putting big dialogues in their faces. And this is something that this applies to every genre of game. I don't necessarily think that it's limited to to any one particular game game type. You want to be able to show, not tell. And in the puppy cave for Dungeon Mans, which is the Scrollbold Warrens, uh, three tiles away from the academy, the convenient Scrollbold Warrens, there are uh, rock structures where loot is placed in a uh, in a tile. And then uh, six of the adjacent tiles are filled with solid walls, and two of them are open. And those two are sometimes uh, diagonally adjacent to the loot. So to get in, you have to step diagonally. You have to step, you know, numpad 7913. You have to step northeast, northwest to get in there. And you can't just use the arrow keys to do it. Uh, so I'll watch people play sometimes. And they'll they'll see that loot. And they'll go, well, how do I get that? And they're using the arrow keys. And the arrow keys don't work. Or, you know, if they're using the mouse, it's easy. They just click and it walks over there. Or they, they're using the numpad and they realize, oh, I can step diagonally too. And uh, I think the motivation for I need to pick up that shiny thing is pretty great to t- teach people how to do anything. Like, I want that. How do I get it? What do I do? There's got to be a way. And, you know, every now and then, early in development, I'd receive uh, bugs about certain things that weren't bugs that are just poorly explained. But that one was never bugged. You know, people wouldn't say, like, oh, the loot's stuck in a place where I can't get it. Uh, in fact, when they did say that, they'd send me a screenshot and be like, yeah, the loot generated in a wall, like three tiles off <laughs> outside of the room. Like the potion top is sticking out of the rock. Like that's that's the bug. But in uh, most cases, they would say, oh, yeah, there's there's something sitting there. How do I get it? And I think any chance that we get to show people how to play rather than tell them, or even better, let them figure it out on their own, uh, those are the best. That That's the best because that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a double win. We get to... Teach the player something, and at the same time, let them feel smart and cool, which is what we really want them to feel like a lot. Mm. And people hate tutorials generally. It's it's they, you know, one of these. Yeah. It's one of these accepted evils. But people people hate tutorials, but they they also hate being handheld too much. So giving them this kind of challenge to figure out is is a far far better for the player experience, but also I think far better for making them learn. If you just listed it in some text, they would forget. You can move diagonal with with these keys amongst this this other kind of text stuff you got, but if they actually have to go through the learning process through their own thought. That's a, a much more effective way of teaching someone the mechanics. I agree with you, and the entirety of the puppy cave, uh, the scribbled horns, it's designed around that that concept. There are very few hallways in the horns. There are no really uh, single one line hallways where you can form the conga line of death and chew monsters up one at a time that that's a that's a dungeon stable but that doesn't exist in this tutorial dungeon and the reason for that is that dungeon man's wants you to handle enemies in a different way and while it's great if you're in a dungeon you you can kite enemies back to a thin uh, funnel that's good for you but the game gives every character tools to fight in an open space and to fight with cover and that's uh that's that's part of the design too so these so when you think about most roguelikes, and you think, oh, I got to a level that's a big open space, you know, that's like a monster war, and it's a special map, and it happens like six floors in, and it's really scary. Well, that's the first map you get in Dungeon Mans, is big open spaces. And that's because uh, you have tools for mobility 
and for positioning and for area clearing and, and range attacks that you should rely on those before you think, oh, I need to line them up in a hallway and, and kill them one at a time. I think the whole rooms and corridors thing has really gone out of style in a lot of roguelikes. DCSS and Term 4 both use a lot of big open levels. The, the ones that do have corridors, I'm thinking Brogue and Sill, they both end up adding this AI that you can't abuse the corridors for gameplay purposes anyway. So the corridors end up being a, a little bit pointless in certain ways. I, I think it is an, an old style of dungeon design, which which was okay early on, but which veteran roguelikers in particular aren't very excited by. The only good thing I can think about them is that the, in terms of exploration, make it reasonably easy to get from one end of a dungeon to another end of the dungeon feeling reasonably safe. As in, you know that there's not going to be, you know, each step is only revealing one more floor tile, so you can keep tapping across a few times and you're not going to get yourself into, surrounded quickly. But in terms of other types of gameplay, corridor is generally pretty dull. I, I have to agree. Uh, it's I use, uh, there are corridors in a lot of the Dungeon Man's dungeons because that's sort of a there's there's lots of big rooms connected by doors, so you get uh, you don't get lots of single tile quarters, but you do sometimes. And when you do, uh, they're a reward, right? Because it does feel good to line up four monsters in a row and then kill them with a single uh, power drive or or dashing charge or something that, that that clears up a group of monsters. It's fun, right? And it's fun to feel like a hero. And when you're standing in the doorway, cleaving up beast after beast, it does feel uh, kind of badass. But those are limited. Uh, encounters. They don't happen often. They're not the default anymore. Mm. I really like the idea of having things in the early levels to teach players things. And specifically design it so that the procedural generator has these things more often in the cobbled warns or whatever your early quest is. And you talk about loot placement. A combination of the loot placement plus the wall structure to teach mechanics. I think that's a, a beautiful example of, of getting different bits of the procedural generation working together to teach simple but important elements of the game to the player. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's other places where we could do the same thing. I think one example that uh, our, our genre could use if we do something similar, so say someone does make another platformer uh, similar to Spelunky, having jumps that can be crossed if you do a certain thing. You know, there's a distance you have to jump, and if you fall, you don't land on spikes, but you want to cross the jump because there's loot on the other side. So what do you do? And you, you put something there that said, this is attainable, but you have to figure it out. I mean, that's something that we've done is, is since Metroid, right? I mean, Metroid mm -hmm. did that, uh, where they would place something like an energy tank, and you can get it, you just have to figure out how. And sometimes that means come back when you have the power-up that lets you freeze monsters or, or double bomb or whatever. Uh, it's, it's a pretty sound mechanic. You know, it's the carrot, right? That Everyone wants to, to eat that delicious carrot. Brogue does that a lot. Brogue has these locked rooms, and they often have windows. So you can get an idea, oh, there's something in that locked room. And then it's like, well, how do I get the key for that locked room? And then you see the key across a bridge. And like, you see, oh, how do I get ac like across that chasm to get that key? And, and these sorts of things. An important element of that is having kind of open spaces to be able to see that. If you've got everything in closed rooms and corridors, you won't be able to get a glimpse of this other bit of the level, which is currently unobtainable. Uh, I think Brogue's level architecture especially deeper down, uh, has these kind of open caverns and, and large chasms that you can see across but not walk across. And they, they lend you to think about what's beyond these other bits of the dungeon. I think that's quite effective. So I just wanted to point out there's something interesting that's uh, happening recently in the Spelunky community. A third-party tool called Froslunky came out and it allows you, it's, it's basically a level editor, so it sort of allows you to override the procedural level generation. And there are a number of interesting kind of tips and tactics, these sort of advanced uh, tactics that you can do. For example, it's very strange, but maybe uh, using your whip while turned backwards will suddenly give you a boost of acceleration in the other direction that lets you jump just a little bit further than you would have been able to otherwise. And so what the community has done is they have come out with these training levels, which basically consist of these challenges, uh, very similar to what you mentioned in, in Dungeon Dance, where uh, basically you you sort of put the shiny thing in the corner, and you know that there's some way to accomplish it. Um, and these these levels were sort of designed as a training tool 
for players. It just uh, it would have been neat if maybe that had been included in the original game in some way. I'm reminded of in Shirin the Wanderer. There's these kind of puzzle levels that you can play, and they're essentially glimpses into different bits of the game. They're all pre-designed puzzles, separate from the main game, but they have they have these these setups that kind of like you need to take the right steps to solve the problem to to win the puzzle. And they're things that could be encountered in a normal dungeon run. And they act as both a kind of tutorial as well as a fun challenge. But again, it, it would be nice to see the thought that goes into these these tutorial elements be put instead into, well, how can we add this to the procedural generation so it gets incorporated into regular gameplay, these specific setups. Um, and of course, doing that in a way that isn't too boring either, because you you want these to not appear repetitive. I think Dungeon Man does it nice in that it has some of these features only in early dungeons, so that they're there to teach you early on, but later on you don't need to learn that anymore, so you're not going to see that repetitive dungeon feature anymore. I think that the idea of teaching something and having it be part of the uh, part of the experience, they really are one and the same. Uh, it's just the teaching moment comes with less risk. So knowing you can move diagonally to get a loot, that's the teaching moment. It's very easy to go pick it up, and if you don't pick it up, it's fine. Later dungeons, there's uh, situations where you've got complex rooms full of fireball throwing monsters, and some of the escapes are diagonal columns, just because that's how things laid out. If you don't remember then that you can move diagonally, you're screwed. Uh, it's the same lesson, but one time was the training ground, the other time is, you know, die and reroll your character. So uh, it doesn't feel like you're being handheld anymore. It feels like the same experience, but now that the pressure is on. Hmm. Mark, you're busy with all the kind of procedural generation detail in Ultima Ratio Regum. Have you given thought to how the kind of uh, the generation will support the gameplay in this way? A huge amount of thought. Uh, one of the big things is to make sure that buildings make sense and that it's not just a bunch of rooms and corridors and so on. But since the player will will be going around a huge world and there's lots of and there's lots of lots of stuff to explore and to see, one thing I one thing I thought was, thought was quite important from the uh, get go was to make sure that even if someone hadn't stepped into a certain building before, that you could always kind of make sense of what that building was quickly and make some kind of decent, if not perfect, guesses at, guesses about where will the upstairs be, downstairs be, where where will other doors be, where will bedrooms be, and um, important rooms and so on. And so whilst there's a lot of cis in terms in the game for writing kind of architectural grammars for each nation's building style, there's also a lot for making sure that, yeah, that, um, that stairs and doors and things are placed in places which just kind of make sense. So you don't see stairs uh, put next to a... put. Um, place next to a table in a dining room or something, you see them at the end of a corridor or say. And that seems like a sort of blindingly of blind and lingly kind of obvious thing on one level, but given that a lot of classic rogue likes to just clear just clearly dump in uh, stairs and doors and things pretty randomly, it's surprisingly different to walk through somewhere and think, ah, I see, so the layout of this half was this, so I'm guessing that there were that the stairs will be here. Ah, they are indeed here, having never stepped into that building uh, prior. And from what I've got, and from what I've got so far in terms of feedback, um, a lot, um, a lot, a lot of people do seem to have found that the buildings do just make sense. That they generate in a way that someone would build them if they were trying to build a building. In that they, uh, they, they don't waste uh, space. They have rooms which make sense. They lack kind of massive blocks of wall with no rooms and corridors inside it, and so on and so forth. I'm reminded of kind of Spelunky dedicated fans and also Adam dedicated fans who have a good idea of where the exit is mm. from the moment they enter the level because they're so familiar with the procedural generator and its patterns. Yeah, I think I think there's a pretty good chance that that will happen beyond the point and I'm fine and I'm fine with that entirely. Um, it's definitely it's probably a little less important in my case because it's a very combat light game, and so you aren't often going to be in a spot where knowing where the door is is life or death, say. But it's more about kind of streamlining things, I guess, and just making sure people don't spend too long dithering around trying to find where the stairs towards the bedrooms or the stairs towards the basement are. Well, you've got a kind of exploration-based game, so you want to facilitate the exploration as yeah. much as you can, which means kind of letting people see and explore and find things easily without it being a frustrating experience. 
Another good example was um, in uh, in lower class city districts, which only have kind of major roads and then no other roads in the uh, housing. Some and thing I did there was to make sure that every important building will have a road around it, and then that road will then join up to the main road. Again, that's a really simple thing, but it makes it clear when you've explored every part of that district, which matters in air quotes. And so you don't just have to explore every single inch in the hope that there's something of note kind of hiding behind some of the building. Mm. One of the problems with a lot of roadworks is pure randomness. I mean, you mentioned with kind of the the exit placement in levels, for instance. Uh, there's there's a lot of roadworks where that is purely a random thing, and I'm surprised actually how many of the big roadworks you can technically have the stairs generated right next to each other or mm. in rooms right across from each other. Uh, it's, I remember with when I made my first roguelike, you know, one of the simple things was simply doing a distance check between the, the stairs placements so that the player is forced to go through at least a bit of the level. Because you, you want the player to be experiencing gameplay. You want them to be exp- playing the game, as it were. Uh, you don't want to make it too easy. But potentially you don't want to make it too hard either. I remember in the Invisible Ink interview we had when uh, uh, they were talking about how they had like a triangle level generation, as in one point the the starting, one point is the the re- the reward, the base kind of what you're after on the level, and then another point in the triangle is the exit, and so it tries to ensure a triangle of minimum distances between those three, and that again is to encourage this this gameplay type of forcing you to explore to a certain thing and then forcing you to explore to get out again. I do I do do I do do a few things like that, but I also put I'll put a lot of weight in terms of what are certain rooms and doors and stairs used for in the, if you're in a a um if you're in a mansion then the door which leads you to the stairs to the servants quarters and the door which leads uh, up to the uh, large bedrooms won't be right next to each other for instance or in um cathedrals say the uh, staircase going down towards the crypt won't be where the average person were person would be uh, praying, for instance, and so there's a lot of trying to place things so that when you watch how the how the people within those spaces move, they don't they don't kind of overlap in ways which you wouldn't think that which you wouldn't expect in real life, I guess. So that even within a given space, people act in kind of slightly split off groups based on what parts of the level they are. Allowed in, allowed in, and uh, which paths they can uh, interact with. There is an interesting element of of architecture to these sorts of things, and architects will talk to you about how they have to design flow in buildings. Mm. It's considering the flow of people and how people will move around buildings, and making sure that you know they're not having to walk too much of a distance for this and that. Although there's there's kind of reverse elements to this in certain shopping centres, they design it so you do have to walk around to encourage you to maybe buy this or that. And it's interesting looking at things like how supermarkets are designed to encourage you to, to do this or to do that or to find this product. They always put the fresh stuff at the start so you get a feeling of freshness when you walk into the supermarket. Yeah. They don't put the toothpaste at the start. That's not what they want. Or the toilet roll or anything. And this sort of design consideration goes into a lot of real-world stuff. And it's about trying to incorporate some of those lessons and, and making it interesting for the player and traditionally roguelikes you know a lot of them just pure random loot is just randomly spread around the, the dungeon it might be potentially controlled based on kind of the depth that you're at and the value of the items but some of them don't even do that monsters just distributed randomly with a bit of kind of control over the danger level of the monsters and the the actual structure of the level and the exit of the level again random and sometimes with a very minimum of features that are interesting to interact with. But I think we're seeing a lot more modern roguelikes where much more thought is being put into creating things like vaults and things that are interesting to, to interact with and level features that you can interact with and more interesting gameplay based on the placement of things around the level. Agreed. Something quite tricky I found in that regard is that if, say, you have a, um, if you have a kind of mansion, say, then in the real world, a lot of rooms in there will be basically tables and chairs, right? And maybe um, some shelves or some or some uh, or some fireplaces and stuff. But broadly speaking, a lot of rooms 
in real world buildings are basically tables, chairs and beds and some kind of mix of those three. So trying to keep that in there, in the, that's, what, that's what buildings do look like, but trying not to make it too kind of monotonous has proven quite tricky, but I found that, but I found a system which generally puts the most intriguing rooms on the kind of main path which the game thinks the player will take throughout a certain building, and then putting the stuff which should be there for realism reasons, but, but which is maybe rather less, um, intriguing, it puts somewhere off the, uh, beaten path. Uh, I have a question, if that's okay. Uh, Mark? Of course, go for it. So what you're describing is actually really interesting, and uh, if I can go back just a bit, you talked about having layouts in houses that make sense. You know, you want to yeah. talk about um, not putting the toilet next to the door so the door hits the toilet when it opens <laughs> and things like that that are just yeah. common sense. Do you think that knowledge is something players can use to find secret doors when solving a mystery? So I know that, uh, for instance, a procedural quest where where did someone hide the body is not entirely outside the uh, realm of what could happen mm. in your game and saying, hey, in this house, like, boy, this bookshelf's in a weird place. Right. And, and normally I think players wouldn't pick that up. We just kind of bump everything when we're looking for stuff. We just walk into every wall. But if you're so meticulous about your design that things seem sensible, um, something that's not sensible would kind of stand out. Right. Is that the idea? Uh, you kind of stumble on something which I haven't really said, said on the blog before. But, uh, yes, in fact, I think, I think I should be able to reach a point where, where people will spot things which just look strange and which just look out of place and think, hmm. Why is there a vase there exactly? Or why is that bookcase over there when the when the other ten are there and things like that? And that's definitely one of the one of the kind of visual slash spatial clues which I hope to put in. So yeah, yeah, def uh, definitely I think. That's really neat. Cool. And I think it'll work as well. He says confidently. I think it'll work in that, as you say, I think if the if the rest of the world makes enough sense then something which seems to not make sense should stand out more than if the entire world makes no sense and things are just uh, placed at random. I think there's a lot of scope for this even outside of what you're trying to do, Mark, with this kind of realistic thing, which most games, most roguelikes in particular, just ignore because we're not interested in having fully plumbed dungeons. Um, but you know, this kind of idea of, of pattern spotting and having features that make people stand up and say, oh, that's different, this must be... Special. This comes into this, the kind of the, the player psychology of of how things are presented to them and how they start thinking about things and how they approach the game. Um, I'm thinking in particular of um, Brogue has these orange carpets in certain areas of the dungeon. I'm actually I've been disappointed to find that they don't really mean much. But when I was a new player to the game and I would see orange carpet when going around the dungeon, I think it's orange carpet, it's something weird like that. I would think, oh, this must be something really special. I must be, in, and then I would I'd get like that little bit more tense exploring the area which had the orange carpet. I've since found out I don't think it really means much. I think it's, it is fairly random. But you can use features like that, of just slightly changing the color of the walls in an area and making people think, oh, this is, there's something here. I need to take this bit, bit more seriously. And again, sort of tying with the procedural generation, you can have the placement of the monsters or the placement of the loot kind of coming together there to, to have this is an extra challenging bit or something like that. And having little little cues like that in the generation to to make people just sit up and take notice a bit more of this this special little corner of the dungeon. Of course, that was a classic move uh, in Doom, and I <clears throat> I know I keep going back to Doom, I apologize, but if you, uh, if you ever played Doom, you might remember that most of the levels had some sort of secret passages or secret rooms designed into them uh, by the level designer, and almost always the tip or the giveaway to alert the player to a secret uh, would be a misaligned texture or a color that was slightly different or the light uh, shining on a wall in a certain way that was different from the rest of the room. Um, and it's, uh, I always found that just to be fascinating because we as humans are, are really good at sort of picking out when something it doesn't match the pattern that we expect to see. So I, uh, I just always thought that was fascinating to, to use little imperfections like that to tip people off that something is different. Yeah, it's, a, it's almost like a trope in video games that if you see a wall with a few cracks in it, you think, oh, if I put a bomb there, there's going to be something interesting behind there. And I think uh, Bonnie Isaac does that, and 
because it's a very mm. Zelda esque thing. Um, but yeah, that reminded also of Adom uh, has secret passages in it, and usually the way, certainly for me as a kind of veteran player of it, if I've explored a, a level and I notice that the rooms don't go all the way to the side of the screen, or there's one corner of the the map that looks kind of like there should be something there, but it's empty space. Then I'll go around and start kicking all the walls nearby, thinking there must be a secret corridor around here somewhere. There's definitely ways like that, especially when you're very familiar with a game, of picking up on these these mm. little clues that there's a secret there. Design of secrets is something that, that comes again into kind of level design, especially traditional level design, but we can incorporate that into our procedural design with secret corridors and, and things like that. So about um, secrets and and filling out the map, I think what you described in Adon were, oh, I've, I've cleared this level, but there's this big section where there's no tiles. There must be a door here somewhere. Uh, that actually uh, happens on tabletop games, too. When you sit down and play Dungeons & Dragons with friends in a dungeon, and if everything fits on a sheet of graph paper and there's an obvious hole where there isn't a room, they say, well, there's got to be something here. And uh, I wanted to kind of make that metagaming not work in Dungeon Man's uh, but also, the players like to bump, bump walls looking for stuff. That's, a, that's an itch players want to scratch. So the solution I had for that was to have secret rooms uh, be tiny spaces with portals that led to larger rooms. So there was a little space that you could bump into and find a portal inside. Step in the portal, and it takes you to some like 12 wide by 8 tall organized room full of secrets and monsters and whatnot. But it's at some way distant part of the map. And so the maps themselves, the space in the level could be 200 by 200. The active dungeon is only maybe 40 by 40, but there's just places you can teleport to. Uh, and so you don't get the ability to just say, like, oh, did I fill out the entire map? It kind of turns that, that metagaming off. But however, when you're near a secret door, uh, your personal level of science and the amount of research you've done at the academy causes uh, an alert to go off for the player, saying, hey, there's something nearby, which can tell you it's cool to start humping every wall like you want to do and you'll find it eventually because it's within within a short range of you yeah i've died in many of those rooms jim they usually end up being full of horrible death traps in my experience uh now one of them gives you a fair warning uh <laughs> no it doesn't actually it just asks you if you want to go to the super awesome monster party and uh you can say yes or no <laughs> uh but yeah those sorts of things where it's um like an entrance into something, into a kind of a, a greater thing can also be very enticing. Or just, you, we have things like vaults in general where you know you're kind of entering into something exciting. But yeah, you're right, the Adam thing is kind of, a, it's a metagame thing. It's very different from what Mark is saying about having this realistic expectations of a house. And it's, it's up to the designer if you, if you care about having like really, really believable setting or if you don't mind players gaming things at the back of their heads and and not sort of immersing yourself into a kind of role play adventure. I don't mind with Adam because I, I I treat things very abstractly myself. Uh, but there are lots of other ways to kind of incorporate this this secret stuff, and you can even have um, something I've seen more from Brogue really is a monster runs away, and you chase it, and then it's gone. And like oh maybe there's a secret door around here somewhere. There's things like that in the AI behavior where you can incorporate that uh, designing. Around the AI is kind of an interesting thing. Brett, you talked about how the kind of the need for your AIs to work required these open levels and these these interesting obstacles. Jim, I was wondering if you have any examples like that where you kind of you've had to consider how the AI works in the environment and design the environment around them or design the enemy placement around how the environment works. Yeah, uh, thank you. There are a couple of cases where um, monsters were monsters and areas. Uh, didn't work very well at first, and they had to be modified. Uh, but they not not quite as complex as maybe some other games. I think the AI in Dungeon Man's is pretty straightforward. Uh, find and crush the player. You know, there's there's very little in terms of uh, laying clever traps and such like that. Uh, but one thing that um, that mattered was trying to decide how ranged combat would work. So the question is, do do monsters block line of sight? for each other and for the player, right? So if you have a hallway and there's five monsters in the hallway and the monster in the very back is an archer, can he hit you if the four monsters in front of him are melee fighters or there's any monsters at all? And can the player shoot in the back? And so that was a, that was a question I had for a while. And I started with monsters blocking line of sight because that felt the most real. 
and this is a roguelike, so it has to be real, right? Or we're just not legit. <laughs> and uh, when I started making graveyard levels, I realized that uh, I was I was losing, I was missing out by having monsters block line of sight. First thing, graveyards became full of half height cover, which is to use the, the you know big game dev term, but it's just the uh, the idea of like gravestones, stuff you can't walk through, but you can see over, right? So gravestones and uh, and fences were things that blocked movement but not line of sight so you could fire over them and you could just cast spells over them and whatnot and when skeleton archers showed up there would be this this big fracas like okay well, i can hide behind these gravestones from the melee guys but the archers can still hit me and that's really cool and you know trying to create tension by having just the right mix of them was great and then it all got nullified as soon as you found a spot where the melee guys could get to you and because of the way it was positioned even though the archers might be able to see you if they moved the melee guys were blocking line of sight, right? That you were using bad guys as a, as a shield. And that's cool for some games, but it just didn't seem to fit for Dungeon Mans. And I saw it live in action playing in the, the graveyard levels. It was just like, no, this doesn't feel as good. You know, I've got this big open space. It's supposed to be scary. It's supposed to be full of, of undead busting up from the ground. And I can still rely on that tried and true tactic of like turtling somewhere and hiding behind tall monsters. And it just, I dropped it. So the, that, that's why ranged combat, you can fire over anything over any monster. And that also, I don't know, it made it more fun for the player too to, to have target priority be an issue. You know, if there's five bad guys that you can see, they can all see you. And you should pick the most important one to kill. And if lining them up doesn't protect you from the ranged guy. So he can still shoot over his four buddies to get you. And uh, and that that came about from the way graveyards were built. So that's kind of an answer to your question. I think maybe Mark or Brett will have a better answer because they might have more complex or interesting AI than some of the demons monsters did. So in Rogue Space Marine, like I, I said previously, it's it's really comes down to it's a game of timing. Um, so the player has different abilities, and those all have cooldown timers associated with them. In a similar way, uh, the enemies that the player is sort of fighting against, uh, they also have abilities in the form of attacks, and those also have cooldown timers associated with them. Um, at certain moments in time, they will stop moving. At certain times, they will move faster. And, you know, this is really not very complicated AI either. Um, but there's a bit of a rhythm to it, which is, which is kind of an interesting thing. And, um, you know, Rogue Space Marine, it's, it's actually, uh, it's a real time game that, that pauses. Time sort of plays out as you move and it pauses when your action has been completed. But, because every enemy moves a different distance and they can move in different directions, they, they end up not being on the grid most of the time. Um, and they might be halfway between a turn when, when time stops. Uh, maybe they're right in the middle of firing and there's a bullet sort of in midair, frozen there on its way towards you. Um, and so when I was designing the architecture, what I really needed to, to figure out was creating an interesting space where the player could use that sense of timing to their advantage. It's almost a rhythm uh, game in a strange way because you're, you're waiting for the, the enemy to attack and then hopefully dodging out of the way and then trying within the amount of time that it takes for their, their ability to come back online to, to sort of launch a counterattack. So it was really a question of just trying to find... Uh, size of cover, distance uh, between pieces of cover, um, how big is the, the largest open space that I want to have, and, and these kinds of things, so that the, the player could sort of learn that rhythm and then use that understanding of that rhythm to their advantage. Yeah, and it works quite nicely. In that way, it's the, the bullets moving slowly and having to dodge turn by turn and so on. Did you have any trouble with uh, enemies navigating the kind of the obstacles of both the, the different terrain types and their own bullets. Uh yes, they they have very simple pathfinding AI. It was actually my first attempt at, at doing any of that, so I was I was reading tutorials, you know, uh on on pathfinding and these different algorithms to try to make it all work. And um you know, like Jim was saying in Dungeon Man, sometimes he he would try something uh, make a gameplay element work a certain way for the sense of, of realism, but then found out that maybe it, it wasn't the best decision from a gameplay perspective. And 
And I had a very similar uh, kind of catharsis when it came to enemy projectiles and their attacks. And originally, I, you know, I, I, I love Doom so much, I wanted infighting. Infighting is this great thing from Doom where if, if you are able to line up one enemy behind another and they accidentally shoot their friend, then they get in a fight amongst themselves. And, and that was something that I had in, in Rogue Space Marine early on. And unfortunately, I had to get rid of it because with these relatively sort of tight spaces that the game takes place in, it was just far too easy to get a giant room of monsters fighting each other, and then the player would would have nothing left to do. Uh, so it just it just wasn't fun. So um, I basically ended up just giving them very simple pathfinding. They try to find the shortest path to navigate to the player, and they they fire when they have line of sight, and you know their projectiles will pass right through other enemies. And while that's not realistic, it turns out that out of that really simple sort of AI and combining that just with the cooldown timers. It was really the cooldown timers um, that added some complexity to it. It would be enormously boring, uh, I think, if uh, if those if that rhythm sort of didn't exist. So, so yeah, very very simple AI. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, but it works well enough. Mark, you've been playing around with AI lately. Uh, have they been able to get around your cathedrals? Yes, yes. Uh, they behave pretty smartly now. I think. Um... Aside from aside from people who are important enough that the game should track them regardless of where the player is in the in-game world, which I haven't done yet, uh, yeah, pe- yeah, people behave pretty smartly. They will go and pray at the altar. They will sit down, sit down and study the holy texts. They will talk with each other. They will talk with the priests. They will go out. They will walk around the towns and uh, cities in a way which makes sense. And then one thing I found which is quite neat is um the kind of based on based on the um based on the ideologies of each nation, then sort of certain groups of people which make sense for that nation will will uh, spawn. So if say there's a nation which has a really strong uh, priesthood and also uh and also does uh conscription, say, then you might find priests being escorted around by conscripts and this type of thing. And there are a few slightly, um, a few slightly funky issues, like people spawning in dead ends where they couldn't um, have spawned in clearly and that type of thing. But that's pretty much fixed now. And at the moment, basically, you can just sit down in the middle of a city or a town and just hold down the next turn button, and you'll and you'll see hundreds of people from various nations going around their business. Hmm. You're going to have the particular problem with you've got a lot of NPC interaction and in most games the AI just moves towards you or sticks around you because they want to fight you and you've got this conflict. You know, the AI interacting with the gameplay directly, the AI routine is based around that sort of gameplay interaction of conflict with them. Whereas you're going to have them having their own lives kind of thing, yet the player will maybe want to interact with some of them in certain ways at certain times and that's going to be a, a bit trickier, I imagine. Yeah, uh, right now they like to follow roads, and then, so, and then sometimes they will decide to go to uh, move off the road and then kind of pathfind to some building that they want to enter. Um, also, people will sometimes spawn inside buildings and then leave them so that when you kind of when you sit still and just watch the world go by, in general, people walk down the roads, but some, but um, sometimes someone will come from off a road and then pass to on that road, or uh, vice versa. And that was kind of because in the first trial, where people kept to kept to the roads, the roads kind of ceased to look like roads and more like um, tunnels or channels, whereby people just moved down those. But that wasn't really very um, organic. And also in um, in certain areas, in uh, parks and in um, memorials and places like that, people will go off the roads and then just sort of sit round there or uh, stand round or meet friends and chat and then they'll break up and then move on. I mean, right now, um, one thing I found that worked quite well is to have a different character for each for each uh, class of person, so you know if someone's an important and NPC or just a kind of average um, citizen and the average people are partly there just to make the world look like it's lived in and so on but also partly there to kind of reflect how that nation slash culture slash uh, religion 
thinks without necessarily having it exp um, explicitly told to the player. So if you bump into a bunch of people who you know all worship a certain god, and then you look at them and all their clothes are really uh, poor and tattered, then perhaps you'll know, okay, so maybe this religion thinks that poverty is a kind of holy vow or something like that. Or if you see a lot of people within a certain nation um, around certain buildings, then those are likely to be important buildings and so on. So there's a lot of sort of thematic slash storytelling stuff, which I'm trying to tell just based on how the how the people behave, rather than having the game tell you in this in this country pe people really like to go and do this or people worship this and so on. I think it's much it's much kind of neater if you can somehow divine that from just watching the crowd and seeing how people how how people behave. Hmm. Jim, you mentioned earlier about kind of the the turtling that can happen around gravestones and other other features of a dungeon or of a level. And this is a, a particular problem in a lot of roguelikes, whereby if something is presented as an easier option, then players will just want to sit down and keep repeating it. Uh, and you've mentioned that using archery, going over melee people, is, is one solution to that. Um, I'm just thinking of the, the other ways that games take that into account in their, their design of their AI or their design of their levels. Um, Sill and Brogue in particular have certain enemies that will not just sit at the mouth of a corridor and let you keep hacking away with them. They will they will go and find the mouth of a corridor and then crowd around it and wait for you to come and get ganged up on by them. Um, and that's kind of certain intelligent play, but at the same time can lead to a, a little bit of dancing around to try and defeat them. Um, but it, it represents an interesting challenge as opposed to the, the usual just sit in a corridor and keep pressing the, the left arrow key. It's rather neat that Syl does that. I think that's really cool. I think that uh, that's something you can build into the, when you create the level procedurally at, at runtime, you can actually mark locations as mm. good places for AI to hang out and try to, to gang up on somebody. You know, uh, one of the, where using AI to, to make fights more interesting is, of course, like, it's like the second and most important thing AI has to do, right? The first being like, be able to walk to the player uh, but the second is is to make fights interesting, and there are a few monsters in Dungeon Man's that will, and I think a lot of games do this, create dangerous terrain. So whether it's that throw a bomb that blows up in a few rounds, or they actually uh, create ice walls, or they they highlight the ground with red marks, and if you're not out of it next turn, you get run over or bombed by artillery. Mm. That sort of thing happens. And I think, I, I mentioned this in my IRDC uh, US talk, that it's the third element of, of level design, is that the monsters can actually create things for you to do. And the number one game right now that does this, like, hands hands down, number one game is uh, Necrodancer, right? Every Necrodancer monster has, like, weird things of patterns that they make tiles dangerous, or it's going to be dangerous in two beats, and you just have to know. And you could play that game in a giant empty box. In fact, you do sometimes. And it just becomes this really interesting maze that shifts every turn because of how the monsters work. It's brilliant. And that's something that, that actually counts for level design when you think about it. Because if you say, well, here are the monsters we're going to place in this area, then you know the behaviors they have, and you can then say, here's the rooms I'm going to make, and accordingly, they're going to be larger, emptier rooms. Because I know the monsters are going to fill it with fiddly steps and crosses and things to avoid. Yeah, I was, I was absolutely going to bring up Necrodancer as, uh, as a beautiful example of this. And if anyone hasn't played Crypt the Necrodancer, I, I recommend giving it a go to see its array of interesting monsters and monster behaviors and how you're forced to react to that. You can play as a bard if you want the turn-based experience. But yeah, the the procedural generation creates the initial setup for the level, but you have to take into account that you may have a changeable level, and indeed it, it may be more fun to have a changeable level. I certainly think it's far more interesting when you have terrain that changes and AI that can affect terrain in interesting ways. And even if it's a case of... Um, like you talked about the gravestones in the level. If you know, you could have that if a gravestone gets surrounded by three or, or more enemies, then that gravestone's gonna get crushed by them. And you know, you cannot just stay in the one position forever. They the enemies will tear the train apart to get to you. There's a there's some really interesting enemies in Hyper Rogue by Xeno. Uh, in the ice level, for instance, you have these walls of ice. But the longer you or any enemy is beside a wall of ice, the the quicker that wall of ice will just melt away. So it absolutely prevents any continuous bottleneck gameplay like that. 
That's a really interesting idea. There's a lot of really neat concepts in the game. It also has the the creeper plants that kind of slowly expand over time. You can only attack the outside bits of the plant. If you go to the inside bit of the plant, you'll get killed. Those are the worst. The you worst. Are, so. They are evil. <laughs> so you're constantly kind of dancing around the edges of the plant, trying to keep it pushed back and to slowly move the the whole all of the branches back and not let the branches surround you. And these sort of evolving things, um, I think the, the creeper plant's a great example of something that it's not quite AI, it's not quite terrain, it's a, it's a bit of both. These sorts of evolving features in the dungeon or changing features, they absolutely prevent repetitive play because they require you to think ahead a few turns and think about how things will change. And if they make permanent changes or even just temporary changes to the environment, um, then they prevent you just repeatedly doing the one action. So there's, there's definitely a lot can be done there, and there's a lot on the, the generation side, like you said, Jim, about kind of marking areas for AI to make use of, but also kind of making making the AI able to change things or making the dungeon able to react to the AI in certain ways it can bring about more interesting emergent gameplay like that. Darren, you had said you've got these gravestones and you're fighting, and if more than three gravestones are around, the gravestone crumbles, and that'll that'll get monsters to chew through the terrain and get to you. And I thought, damn, I missed an opportunity to have those gravestones turn into more monsters mm. when they're surrounded by undead, right? So that if you truly try to use them as cover, not only do they fall apart, but like more zombies show up because, hey, I heard there's a party, and they come up <laughs> out of the ground because there's more undead there. And I thought, That's awesome. And yes. uh, it bred in your case, man. It's so easy to have like frozen cryo frozen bad guys who kind of wake up when there's more bad guys nearby right so you've got the the trouble of knowing that you can hide behind something for only so long before it wakes up because it realizes his friends are around and he doesn't want to miss out and that's uh that was really neat i, I should try that yeah, that's quite a natural way of of kind of punishing the player for a certain player certain type of behavior we have like you know monster spawning in levels but we usually try to do it out of sight of the player so it doesn't look really unnatural what you're saying there, particularly with the gravestones and these kind of cryo units and things, that's ways of more naturally including it so that, you know, suspension of disbelief isn't thrown out of the window entirely. Uh, Brett, when you gave your presentation at IRDC, you talked a little bit about Spelunky's level design and how it was done in kind of chunks that were stitched together. I'm going to include the link to, to both your and Jim's presentations below so people can check that out in detail, but do you want to just give a little bit of an overview of that? Sure. Yeah, I can just give a, a basic idea of how it works. You know, it was my first attempt to make a level generator, and so I, I took a lot of inspiration from Spelunky, and I was able to find this this great sort of breakdown of how the generator works, which was made by uh, somebody named Darius Kazemi. And it's it's really quite ingenious. Um, it's it's sort of a multi-layered approach. So there there are multiple steps in the process of making the level, and each one of those steps on its own is actually quite simple, and it relies on human-generated content as sort of a basis. Uh, so the idea is that you create these sort of basic templates, and those are a starting point, and they contain the, the rough architecture for a room. And, you know, I described with Rogue Space Marine, uh, I was basically just making these things by hand and trying to get a, a basic idea of space and what size of a room felt, felt good. And uh, from that point, you you then after selecting one of those templates you then sort of randomly select from some subrooms or some obstacles or some smaller pieces that fit in uh to those rooms and those are also uh selected with with some element of chance and so you're basically you know selecting a starting room uh and from from a number of options you're filling it with with a few smaller interesting pieces uh, which are sort of randomly selected and you build up those layers and you achieve this really interesting complexity out of these multiple layers of simplicity which I think is really elegant and you know the the wonderful thing about this approach is that it's it's modular there's this modularity so um, the step of designing these template rooms you as a game designer can go in and you can test those rooms as much as you want on their own and you can fine tune them and tweak them and try to make them as fun as possible. And then also in the next step, sort of creating these subrooms or pieces. I mean, all of those can be tested individually. Um, so you have a tremendous amount of control for creating this finely crafted experience. But in the end, the level generator just makes a mishmash of all of that. It, it selects all of these pieces sort of randomly. It cobbles them together. And so you always get a very different result. 
Uh, so I think it's, it's fascinating. And, uh, you know, both Jim and I talked about that at our IRDC and, um, yeah, really cool stuff. A lot of interesting lessons to be learned there, I think. Hmm. And doing that gives you a lot of potential control over what you're doing. You could, you could give each, you know, modular component a certain rating for, for challenge or reward or whatever else and, and make sure that there's, you know, the right flow of those, that you're not getting lots of empty rooms or not getting lots of really, really hard rooms too much clumped together. And and also not making sure that too much of the interesting stuff is is thrown out, so that you know you you seed out kind of every every one in twenty rooms on average gets to be something very exciting. Absolutely, yes, yes. There are there are, there are lots of sort of very rare things that that could happen with a with a very low chance. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it always keeps things interesting. So even after playing a game like that, which uses that kind of technique for the level generation. Uh, for hundreds or thousands of hours, you always end up uh, being surprised because you can never really guess um, how those elements are going to play on one another to to create the final experience. Just another maybe interesting thing worth mentioning, uh, before you had talked about the concept of having some intelligence in placing the entrance to a level you know, far away from the exit. And in Spelunky, uh, I feel that the primary influence on the architecture is actually gravity. That's kind of the main motivating force in the entire game. The, the entrance is always at the top. The exit is always at the bottom. It's much easier for the player to go down than up. And it's just kind of this uh, constant thing in the background that's, that's always influencing how the level is built and, as a result, how the player is navigating the level. Yeah, every Spelunky level is a controlled fall. Away. That's absolutely right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll include links to, to those details below, the videos from IRDC, the, the details in Spelunky's level design, which are really interesting to read about, and some of the games we've talked about here. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? It was really, uh, it was really great to take part in this discussion. Just thought it was uh, maybe a funny thing to share, but I started out listening to Roguelike Radio several years ago, and I've been not part of the community until I entered the seven day RL and uh you know, suddenly I get to uh talk to Darren and Mark and Jim on an episode, so it's pretty cool how things like that happen. Oh, it's great to have you on. And um yeah, Rogue Space Marine was a real gem from this year. Uh, have you thought about trying to get it on Greenlight? Oh, well yeah, thank you. You uh you know, I, I've taken a lot of feedback from some people who had some suggestions for improving it and I've been making some piecemeal updates um and i would i would love to get it out to more people so um yeah steam Greenlight's definitely on my radar you've already got it on itch.io haven't you that's right yep it's available for free <laughs> well that's about it for this topic this is a pretty interesting area for me i think there's a, a lot more we can be doing with designed procedural generation really thinking about the player experience and how we want the player to be enjoying the game and I think it's also it's one of the areas where we can learn a lot more from other games outside the roguelike spectrum. Looking at how hand design levels are done in other games and seeing what ideas we can nick from that and turn them procedural so that they're infinitely more enjoyable. <laughs> so if people have ideas for that, please do post below. I'd like to hear other good examples for how we can do this interesting gameplay oriented procedural generation. But for now, that's all for this episode. Join us next time for more roguelike goodness. Farewell. Thank you Thanks, very much. Thanks, everyone.